So today I'm gonna take a look at the Breguet Tradition. This is a watch that I've always kind of lusted after. It has been a grail watch for a long time. I didn't think I'd be able to add it to the collection or at least add it this soon. So the, <laughs> the review might seem slightly biased, but at the end of the day, it is a watch that I find very interesting and let's take a closer look. So we have a diameter of 38 millimeters, lug to lug of 45.5, height of 12 millimeters, and a lug width of 20. Some other general specifications for the watch, we're gonna have the Caliber 507 beating away from here. Um, this does have a 50 hour power reserve. Obviously it's a hand wound movement. You can also see the power reserve uh, here on the back and on the front. I have tested it myself and it has gotten closer to a 70 hour power reserve, which is nice to see. The entire case here is made out of 18 karat gray gold, which is a white gold alloy. We do have a sapphire crystal on the front and the back of the watch. We have a stated water resistance of 30 meters with a regular push-pull crown. And last but not least, this watch, although it's discontinued, it used to have a retail price of about uh, $26,000 to $28,000. And nowadays on the market, you can find it between $12,000 and $18,000. So starting off with the dial here, and this is pretty much the star of the show. At the end of the day, you're getting a relatively small time-telling area. You just have this 12 o'clock dial disc, I guess you could say. Um, and the rest of the watch is basically the movement. So focusing on the dial, this is actually made out of gold that is then galvanized to make it black. Uh, and then you have guilloche cut into the dial in the middle there. On the outside, you have the pad printing process to get the uh, numerals and the text on the dial. While the guilloche is small, it definitely pops a little bit more, both in direct sunlight and obviously when you look a little bit closer to it, it is sometimes hard to see from wrist view, that kind of very intricate clue de Perry pattern. Uh, but it is also really a nice touch that is one of those things where the details kind of scream at the quality. We of course have this very small Breguet handset for the hour and the minute hand. No seconds hand on the watch anywhere, but uh, it's not a deal breaker because to be fair, it'd be kind of hard to see from wrist view anyway. I like that the text was kept very minimal. We just have Breguet and the serial number here at the 12 o'clock. And it's done in a kind of curved pattern, which I think really nicely mirrors the curved uh, kind of arrangement of the gear train down here. It, there's just a lot of symmetry in this watch and I really like it. It's just aesthetically pleasing. So zooming in a little bit and focusing here on the, I guess, rest of the dial, uh, this is where most of the movement is, this is where most of the gears are, and it honestly is kind of the main attraction of this watch. You do have on display here the great wheel, the third wheel, the fourth wheel, and the escapement all here, and you can also see the balance wheel going away here. Very nicely symmetrically laid out. You have all these finger bridges individually for each wheel that just looks really nice and is also a, a kind of callback to vintage Breguet pocket watches. Focusing on the main kind of base plate and the bridges, those I believe are done in gold, they might not be. Uh, <laughs> and then they are kind of frosted and blasted to get this kind of uh, appearance to them that is not kind of traditional, it's not a striping, it's not a kind of in your face finishing technique, it is very subtle, but it is a very nice effect. It gives a very kind of subtle sparkle sheen that definitely comes out in direct sunlight. And I think just gives a, the watch a really nice uh, kind of almost utilitarian look. Of course, you have black polish on all the screw heads which pop out in the light, um, and it is just a really nice looking watch. There is a lot going on. It seems very complicated, but at the end of the day, this is a time-only watch with a power reserve. I really like the layout of this watch, not only because it's just very symmetrical and uh, just pleasing to the eye, but even though the time telling is kind of a secondary nature to the watch, you can see the mechanics of how it tells time. That's just very interesting to be able to see on the front of your watch without having to turn it over, without it being kind of covered by gears and plates and screws and all this other stuff. It's very, very in your face. It's a very visceral time telling experience. So taking a look in more direct sunlight, we can see when the sun is shining on the dial, we have the brighter, more silvery, shiny gray tone that pops out and it really just draws in the light. And it's a very, very kind of contrasted finish to what we get more in the shade. It goes more gunmetal gray, it goes a little bit more muted, and uh, it's interesting because it's almost like the gears now take a back seat to the finish of the plates itself, which is a really nice kind of change of pace for the dial. Going back into shaded light, we have those gears that pop out again, the black polished screw shine much brighter, um, and it's, it's just a different feel to the watch. Thankfully, the Breguet is something that looks good in direct sunlight, but actually is still beautiful in uh, the shade as well. Zooming in here on the dial, you can definitely appreciate the Clou de Perry guilloche pattern a lot more. It is obviously cut with a rose engine, so it's a very traditional way of doing the guilloche. And as you move it around, the kind of pyramidal shapes form and disappear and lighter shades and darker shades come out. And it is just a really living and fun pattern. 
Moving on from that, you can see the, the hand stack, they are done in this kind of blasted silver texture, and which is very interesting. I haven't really seen this done to hands before, and it's nice because it doesn't make them overly shiny. It helps them contrast against the dial, and at the end of the day, it just helps with legibility. The hand itself is also interestingly shaped. Of course, it is a Breguet hand. You have the kind of base middle of the hand that has a three-dimensional kind of curve to it, and then you have the actual end of the hand that points out to the numerals, and that is more of a flat, uh, not curved, kind of more 1D structure, and it gives the hands a very interesting look, which I haven't really seen from any other handset. Looking at the rest of the dial itself, you can see the kind of layers and the more concentric circles that hold all the text are done very nicely. They have this very inky black quality to them, and then the text has a nice silver sparkly sheen to it. You can see there is like a little bit of guilloche between the layers, this kind of square-ish pattern that I think just looks really cool and gives an extra added depth to the watch. At certain angles like this, you can see in the track that holds the Breguet lettering and that holds the Roman numerals, you have this kind of concentric circling that pops out, which is just another added little detail of finishing that just looks really nice on the watch. I do just really like how much depth and layering they built into this very, very small dial here. Uh, and that just really shows the attention to detail that Breguet has. Moving on to the rest of the dial, you see here we do have the power reserve. And what's nice is you also have the numerals denoting the power reserve engraved down into the plate itself, adding a more depth to the watch, adding even more levels to what is already a very, very three-dimensional movement. Looking at the bridges and especially at something like this angle, you can just see how tall uh, that bridge really is to get up and support that gear. It is just very interesting. And again, this is all happening in a 12 millimeter watch. So it's not incredibly thick by any means, but there is just a lot of depth built in. Again, the screws are black polish. You can see that more fine frosting technique on display a lot more. The jewels and the kind of more silvered englage and polished portions definitely pop a lot against this more kind of base monotone uh, just dial finishing. Unlike most modern watches, we have more of a traditional callback to watchmaking here with the finger bridges. They look really interesting. It's not something you see very often at all, but it is nice uh, to see it executed here the way it is. And focusing there, you can obviously see the pallet fork beating away. Really, really nice to see. You can see the balance wheel. You can see the Breguet overcoil there and the hairspring. Just lots and lots of beautiful watchmaking here on display immediately on the front of your wrist, which is awesome. Another little point of watchmaking history that you can see is this more silvered brush portion standing out from the bridge here is the parachute shock resistant system invented by Breguet in the late 1800s. So it's awesome to see that a uh, watchmaking invention that's that old is still being used in a modern timepiece that is kind of able to keep up with modern day timekeeping standards. Overall, I think the dial is just beautifully done. You have so much mix of finishes and textures. You have brushing on wheels and cogs. You have uh, high polished englage on the finger bridges. You have just high polished screws. You have the jewels on display that are popping in this kind of reddish pink tone. Of course, the black dial and the kind of silver accents on the dial themselves. There's just a lot going on and it is all pretty beautifully executed, I think. There really isn't any QC issues that I see. So focusing on the case of this watch, and while not as complicated or complex as the dial itself, it is still very nice and very Breguet. Um, from the top portion, we just have a, you know, 18 karat white gold case. It is very, very circular in the mid case itself. You have these very prominent kind of stick lugs that really stand out. Very small-ish crown that has a fairly nice knurling, easy to wind, really nice winding action. If you could hear that. What's really nice is if we turn it around while we're winding the watch, you can actually see that winding action happening right there in the gears, which is a really fun kind of touch to see. Looking at the side of the case, we get not only the signed B in the Breguet crown, but we have this fluted mid case, which is really fun. You do have holes in the lugs here, not typical drilled lug holes. It's more a hole that is designed for the screw pin bar that Breguet uses. I don't have them because I'm not using the original strap. One, because I wasn't given the original strap, and uh, two, because I didn't feel like putting uh, these screw bars on every other single strap I wanted to try the watch on. So although it's a very nice system and it's meant to prevent your watch from dropping, regular pin bars are doing just fine. And as you can see, we do have tiny little holes on the underside of the lug to make sure that screw goes nowhere and it's like double fixated in. As we have it in the side portion, you can see there really is not a lot of height to this very complicated watch. Um, at the end of the day too, you have these like small little tricks that help visually thin down the watch too. You have a very sloped 
uh, concave bezel here and as well as on the bottom we have a kind of mirrored concave case back and they're just very nicely curved they feel very good on wrist um, and then this case back pretty much sits invisibly into the wrist which makes the watch feel even thinner one interesting point about the lugs is there is actually a slot uh, kind of in the case where the lugs are fit into it's actually a completely separate piece and then the lugs are welded on and then the weld is kind of hand filed away to make it look like it was never welded in the first place. It is a little bit complicated, a little bit complex, a little bit unnecessary, but that's luxury watchmaking. Zooming in a little bit closer on the case back here, although this isn't as complicated as the front, it is still very nicely done, very uh, utilitarian almost in its design, because honestly there's not much going on back here other than the powers of indicator and kind of the winding system. But it is still very nicely done. You have black polished screws, you have gold accents, you have uh, some high polish in the engalage, inward angles. And one thing I would like to note is that the case back is just perfectly proportioned in this watch. The movement takes up a very, very big portion of the watch case itself. There's not a lot of like empty space. There's not a lot of uh, case making up for the fact that there's a very small movement hiding away in here. It is very much a movement that feels built for this watch. So moving on to how this watch wears, earlier I was wearing my Moon Swatch here, and the main reason for that is the tradition kind of came out in 2005 when Swatch took over Breguet. So it is very much a nice tie-in, and also the Moon Swatch is just a fun watch. So here we have the Breguet sitting on my 6.5 inch wrist, and I think you can see it wears pretty beautifully. The lug-to-lug -lug isn't too long, but I would say because they have a fairly straight lug stance, it doesn't curve insanely down, it doesn't make it wear any smaller than you would expect. So for me, you have to get the right size for you. The 40s actually feels too big for me visually just because of how long those lugs feel. So just keep that in mind. Moving the watch down a little, I have closer to a six inch wrist here and you can see it is definitely approaching that kind of maximum visual heft. So honestly, if you wore this on like a five and a half inch wrist, five inch wrist, I don't think it would look that good. Looking at the watch down the barrel here, you can see it does wear pretty flatly on the wrist, pretty comfortably. It doesn't rise up too high. Uh, again, for how complicated the watch looks on the front, there isn't a lot of heft going on in the mechanic side, so it's nice to see that you're not wearing a 16, 18 millimeter watch that would be pretty unwieldy. And looking at it from more of the side view, you can see it does wear pretty comfortably on wrist. Again, the lugs don't conform perfectly to the wrist itself and don't really lie flat. So again, that's just something to keep in mind. But at the end of the day, I think this is the right size for me. It fits comfortably, it looks good. Uh, and overall, there aren't really any sharp edges on the watch. It doesn't dig in any way, the crown is well sized, so it is just a really nice watch proportionally and wears pretty well. And then really quickly, just to note before we move on to some other straps, this is not the original strap, this is an ostrich leg strap from Keep Peace, but this is the original Breguet white gold buckle that holds that same screw system that you would find in the lugs. One, I wasn't sent the original strap, so I couldn't really put it on the watch, but this is the only strap I had uh, kind of in my arsenal that was similar to it. It comes on a black alligator that it's a little bit more matted, so this black ostrich leg kind of looks along the same kind of grain and feel and just matches pretty well with the time telling uh, dial disc. So moving on to some other straps starting here with this very nice monotone color, uh, monotone styling from Delugs. This is a gray Nubuck strap, not too bad. And uh, one thing I will note is I've ordered two straps from them now and both of them have been undersized. I've ordered 20 and this looks much more like 19 and a half, 19. So that's a little bit annoying, but just something to keep in mind. I do generally really like the color tones here. Very monotone, very subtle. It, it, it does uh, not scream out as, you, as much as the black alligator does. And it takes on a much more industrial feel with this strap. Next, we have this beautiful, I believe they call it Swift Leather from Keep Peace Straps. Um, very, very thin, very supple. It has a kind of lived in aged grain to it, which I just really like and dresses down the brigade nicely. Uh, so I just dig this combo, adds a little bit of life, a little bit of color to the watch too. And there we have it on wrist. One of my favorite combos for this watch just really adds a little bit of life to it, but not too much. It's not too casual. It's not too dressy. It's just a perfect in-between everyday type strap. Next, we have this nice blue alligator grain strap from Veblenist. One of the main reasons I put this watch on is because I know people will say that watch belongs on alligator and here it is for you guys. Um, but the other main reason is because if you have a spring bar that's kind of too thin, you can kind of see here that it comes very, very close to the like opening of the lug hole, which is a little bit scary. So just make sure your spring bar isn't too thin, too uh, kind of svelte that to where it actually will fly through the holes of the brigade and make your watch fall off, which wouldn't be great. Um, most of my straps don't do that, and especially quick release straps seem to not have that issue. So just be wary if you have these kind of a very, very thin spring bars. 
Not my favorite combo, but I don't mind it. The blue and the gray is not a bad combination, uh, but I think I just like some of my other straps a little better. And to anger those who thought the alligator was the perfect combo, here's this very, very bright pink strap. I really, really love this strap because you do have these like darker hints of pink that shine through on the kind of like the grain. Um, so I just really like how this pops on the watch. It's not too super bright, it's not too super pastel, um, and it really just brings out the color of the jewels a little bit, I think, uh, and it just is a very, very fun combo. Although this may not be a combo for everybody, why not make the watch as fun as possible? Just don't make it serious at all. Uh, so, you know, life's too short to, to not smile a little bit. And here we are adding some color to the watch without making it too obnoxious. We have this very nice dark green fluco suede strap. I really love how rich this combo is. The gray and the green work perfectly together. Um, and yeah, I think it's just a very, very beautiful uh, casual combo. Super nice combo, super rich. Uh, I do really love wearing it on this strap. For you more traditionalists, this is just a nice deeper tan color. This is also a fluco strap. I'll have it linked below. Um, very nice combo, very casual, but not too casual to where it's pink or it's suede. And there we have it on wrist. Looks pretty great, I think. The colors work really well. I think this watch really works well with browns and kind of light tans and colors like that. And last but not least, my most expensive watch on the classic Archer silicone strap. Not bad overall, but this is the one watch where I go, you know what, Archer, you're not perfect for this watch exactly. Maybe if I want to walk uh, on the boardwalk of the beach and have a nice summer combo maybe but hey had to do it because put it on every watch so pros and cons of this brigade here and one of the biggest pros for me is just the size of it i really like that they made something this complicated this awesome this architectural at 38 millimeters i would say it is very much a contemporary size but with vintage just kind of ties right it's not a 34 or 36 millimeter, but it's also not a 40 or a 42. It's a kind of sweet spot that pays homage, but also kind of looks forward into the future. And I think it's perfectly sized, at least for my wrist. My next pro for the watch is I just love the design. It is very symmetrical. It's very pleasing to the eye. You get a lot of architectural looking elements on the watch. You have the balance wheel, you have the pallet fork beating away that you can all just see with the naked eye, which I think is really, really interesting because with most watches, you just have to turn the watch around to see something like that. And it's nice to just kind of get that instant gratification kind of looking at the watch and seeing the kind of beating heart of it. My next pro is I think this is just a great watch like value wise. Now saying anything that's thousands and thousands of dollars is value is it's kind of insane, but I mean, that's the hobby that we are in. So uh, for this watch, you know, retail somewhere around 26 to 28,000, but on the used market, they're between 13 to 18. Uh, and I think for that price point, not only are there not a lot of other things competing at that price point, other than maybe like, you know, secondhand Rolexes and whatnot, it is a price point where for the watch and the caliber watch and the caliber watchmaking that you're getting, it's kind of ridiculous. I think you can pick up this Breguet, at least in current market conditions, for less than a stainless steel Submariner. It's kind of insane. My last pro for the watch is just that it looks fantastic in direct harsh sunlight. Uh, usually that's an area where some watches kind of get let down a little bit, or, and that's fine. It, harsh sunlight is harsh. <laughs> kind of the, the, it is by definition that way. Uh, but sometimes when the, when the lighting's too harsh, and there's too much light on the dial, it can kind of either bring out imperfections or it can cheapen the look of the watch in some way. But with this watch, it actually almost looks better in direct sunlight. You get that uh, frosted type finish that pops out a little bit more and you get a second nature to the watch. So moving on to cons, and to be fair, I don't have many. Uh, there's not many that I could find with this watch, at least personally. Uh, one of the bigger cons I think is probably the legibility. It is a very, very small uh, time telling area. It's just this tiny little dial at 12 o'clock. And I have, you know, shown this watch to some friends and they said, I can't really see the time. And you know, that's okay. I can <laughs> at the very least. But I can see myself, you know, if I get older and my eyesight starts to fade and I need glasses and whatnot and all this good stuff, it might start getting a little bit harder to read the time. To be fair, I don't think many of us collect watches to tell the time anyway. So at least with this watch, even though the time is a little bit of an afterthought, uh, one, I can still read it and two, it's okay. It still looks pretty. And another con I have with the watch, and even though this is not something that bothers me immensely, it's one of those things where I can see people having an issue with it, and that's the fact that it almost seems unfinished. It's not very flashy, it doesn't have a lot of striping or blued screws or golden cogs and wheels. Uh, it is just a very almost underwhelming and monochromatic and under the radar type look. And I do like that because it lets the gears of the watch shine more. It draws your attention away from the base dial and kind of towards everything else that's going on that's 
making the watch work. To be fair, if this had like a guilloche base plate, it would look fantastic, it would be cool, but I do think it might draw a little bit of tension away from uh, the balance wheel and all the other moving parts. So it's kind of like whatever camp you fall into. I know they do a version which is like more of a silverish white dial and it has blued screws and it has golden wheels. So that one pops a little bit more and feels a little bit more traditionally finished, but even still it does have that kind of frosted grain finish as well on the main uh, base plates and bridges. So it's one of those things where even when it gets a little bit fancy and overly finished, it's not that in your face really. So final thoughts, and I love the watch. Uh, for me, it's a perfect size. It's an interesting just watch in itself. And at first it was kind of hard to swallow paying this much for a watch. This is absolutely the most I've ever spent on a watch. And it's the idea that one, you can't really find this design language or this execution for really any less, which sucks, but it's also kind of a consequence of the fact that this is complicated to do and not cheap to do. Do I contemplate selling this and buying three other three, four, five thousand dollar watches? Yes. But when all is said and done, there's something about this watch that just grabs me. It is visceral and just kind of how it comes across. It is watch making in a watch. And I know that sounds very weird, but when you look at it and you kind of just try to understand it, it comes across that way. This watch holds the history of watchmaking and its design language. It holds uh, the idea of watchmaking just by being a Breguet, being kind of one of the oldest watch brands out there. Something that I just really love about this watch is it is absolutely unique from any other watch I own. There's nothing else that comes close to this design language, this finish, this look. Uh, and I think that's very important, especially if you, if you have a lot of money tied up in one watch. It's something that hopefully you wanna to gravitate towards, you wanna to wear, and something that's probably hopefully not overlapping with a lot of other watches you already own. At the end of the day, I just do genuinely enjoy owning this watch, wearing it, looking at it. It's probably, you know, in that top three, top five watches that I've ever personally handled. And it's awesome to be able to actually own it. But those are just my thoughts. Let me know what you think. Thank you as always for watching the video. Hope you got something out of it and I'll see you in another one.